How are you doing back at the live stream? I'm not like I can hear you, I'm just assuming that you're enjoying it. How are we doing in-house, how are you feeling? Yeah. Okay, very exciting. I am heading to Turkey this year, so I am so excited for this talk because Gobekli Tepe really is like a crazy smoking gun in the story of our history, and I cannot wait to see it in person. And the, our next speaker is probably one of the best people um, who's gonna inform us all about this. Dr. Martin Swetman is a scientist at Edinburgh University, fellow Brit, yes. And he's the author of Prehistory Decoded and a featured expert in Ancient Apocalypse. Did anyone watch Ancient Apocalypse on Netflix? Yeah. And uh, his groundbreaking work on the decipherment of Gobekli Tepe and his work that, that links Pillar 43 uh, as a timestamp for the Younger Dryas Apocalypse 12,800 years ago, all encoded into the carvings of the animals. Uh, and I, like I said, I've been buzzing. I've been buzzing for this speak, this speech. I'm so excited. Look, I can't even talk. I'm fangirling all over you, Martin. Uh, go, let's give a huge round of applause to Dr. Martin Swetman. Okay. Well, good afternoon. Everyone, it's great to be here in Asheville. Thank you to Johanna. Uh, thank you especially to George um, for inviting me to talk here. Um, okay. So what I'd like to do today is to give you an update on my research into Gebekli Tepe and particularly the, um, or an astronomical interpretation of Gebekli Tepe. So when I say update, what, what do I mean? Update to what? Well, this paper, uh, published this paper back in 2017. Uh, you might recall it, I don't know. Um, sometimes it was called the Fox paper. And we, uh, it hit science media headlines uh, across the world and uh, it was featured in newspapers. A lot has happened since then, back in 2017. I've published a few more papers on the area, and uh, I've been fortunate enough to uh, appear in a few TV programs, as Johanna just said, Graham Hancock's Ancient Apocalypse. Also, you should check out this one, um, Secrets of Gebekli Tepe, so this is Forbidden uh, Histories, uh, season, uh, season seven. It does a pretty good job I think, of explaining this idea. Uh, if, you can, if you can see it, I recommend it. Uh, it's on um, Discovery Science Channel. So um, I'm going to give you an update to that paper. I should explain the main outcomes of that paper first um, to give you some context. So what we said was that, well, the main, the main outcome was that we thought that um, Pillar 43 at Gebekli Tepe was probably a memorial to the Younger Dryas impact. So we said that on the front of this pillar was probably a timestamp, as Johanna said. And so what we said was that probably that disc in the middle of the pillar represents the sun, and the animal symbols likely represent constellations similar to the Greek constellations. And therefore, this pillar was providing a date using precession of the equinoxes. And the, the symbols at the top there, we said those handbag-like symbols, probably they're actually sunsets, and the animal symbols next to, next to them represent the other, represent the constellations on the solstices and equinoxes of the year, the other ones. The main, um, the main one being the eagle vulture representing the summer solstice constellation. So we said that the sun was representing, uh, that disc, sorry, was representing the position of the sun relative to the summer solstice constellation, which we thought was related to Sagittarius. Okay, so that was the main outcome, uh, Pillar 43. And we thought that that date might be related to the Younger Dryas impact. We also thought that Pillar 18, uh, to the left there, uh, we thought that might be related to the Younger Dryas comet itself, and that's because on the front of the pillar, 
You can see these, uh, the sort of belt buckle, the concentric design there, along with the fox uh, loincloth. We thought that looked like the head and tail of a comet. And on the right, you can see pillar two. We thought that might be representing the radiant of the path of the torrid meteor stream. Okay, so the radiant is the position in the sky where the meteor stream emanates from. Uh, and so we thought that, well, at the time, that would have been, uh, the emanation would have been from Capricornus, which we thought was represented by the bull, through Aquarius, which we thought was represented by the fox, and then into Pisces, which we thought was represented by the bird. Okay, so that was what we thought at the time, back in 2017. And that might seem quite speculative, um, were it not for the very strong correlation that we can see between um, what it actually appears on the pillar and what we can see in astronomical software. So if we compare the animal symbols on the pillar with what we expect to see, given this hypothesis, then there's a very strong correlation. And in the paper, we try to measure that correlation statistically. We, we, try, we try to come up with a number or a statistic, uh, and which said, according to, to, to the paper, we, it said that this was extremely unlikely to occur simply by pure chance, and it therefore deserves an explanation. So that was, that was, the key, that was like a key aspect of that paper. Now, I don't want to go into um, that aspect of the paper today. Um, I have another paper currently in peer review which does another does a, a slightly better job, we think, of that statistical evaluation. I don't want to get into all that today. Why did we link it to the Younger Dryas? Well, apart from the date, so if you, if you, can, if you use astronomical software, you look at the position of the sun uh, relative to what we thought was um, the constellation representing Sagittarius, then you can evaluate a date which turns out to be about 10,950 BC to within a few hundred years. And that date it was, was similar to the Younger Dryas impact. But at the bottom of the pillar, you have this headless man. Um, and so we thought that represented death. So it, you know, what we have, therefore, is a, an important date linked with death. Uh, and, and what do we know about that period? Well, we have the Younger Dryas impact. But that also makes a lot of sense as well, because in order to explain the sudden emergence of this kind of structure, or you know, this, this grand monumentality for the first time in the world, in order to explain uh, this, you, you need some kind of, or it's helpful to have some kind of uh, rare and um, um, uh, important event in order to justify you know, the building of this pillar and construction of, uh, of Gebekli Tepe. So we thought it made a lot of sense to relate this to the Younger Dras impact. Uh, so since then, I've published other papers, uh, one paper, a review paper of the Younger Dryas impact itself, the evidence for the impact. Uh, so shortly after that, that was followed up by another very supportive uh, paper by James Powell, which agreed that um, it was you know, very likely um, there was this impact, uh, the Younger Dryas impact. So that's something else that's happened since publication of that 2017 paper. But like I said, I don't want to go into that. I don't want to go into the Younger Dryas impact particularly, or the details of that 2017 paper. What I want to do today is to bring together lots of other evidence, lots of other supporting evidence, that all points towards this astronomical interpretation as very likely being correct. So I'm going to go through uh, a whole list of things. You can see them there, different strands of evidence that all seem to point in the same direction. Okay, now before I go into those eight items, and I don't have a lot, a lot of time to do that, so, but before I go into them, uh, it's worth just giving you a bit more context about Gebekli Tepe itself. Uh, so this, uh, this is the region where we find Gebekli Tepe. You're probably quite familiar with this now. We're at the, um, the eastern end of the Mediterranean. We have the Fertile Crescent, the Levant, uh, Mesopotamia, ancient Babylon and Sumer are down in the lower uh, Mesopotamia. Gebekli Tepe is at the top of that region. You just heard a lot about Abu Huraira, which is about 100 miles south of Gebekli Tepe. Chattel Hoyuk is another important site, which is about 400 miles to the west of Gebekli Tepe. And I'll mention that a little bit. So that's where, we're, where we are. Um, Gebekli Tepe is a hilltop site. Fantastic views over the landscape to the south. Great for naked eye astronomy. So we're looking over um, 
over the Haran plain here, over one of the, um, one of th this particular enclosure is called Enclosure E. Anyway, so it's, it's a great position for astronomy. Uh, visited the place nearly two years ago, so this is what it looks like, uh, looked like then, two years ago roughly. You can see the enclosures, you can see the T-shaped pillars, and you can see that now the site, this, this main part of the uh, excavation area is covered, and there's this walkaway around it. So that's what it looks like now. This is ground, a ground-penetrating radar scan of the broader site. So in that video clip that I showed you, that corresponds just to that little bit down in the bottom right-hand corner of this ground-penetrating ra ground radar scan. So those four enclosures that you saw correspond to those little green um, ovals down in the bottom right. You can see that the extent of the site is much larger. It's a very large site. There are some other interesting structures waiting to be uncovered. Okay, so I will speak up a bit. Can you hear me? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So this is now, um, what we have here is a map of the four main enclosures that you can see, um, that you saw. Hang on, if I just adjust this, it'll probably help. So there is a map. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. A map of the four main enclosures. Um, so you've got enclosures A to D. The, the sort of bluish parts there are the walls of the enclosures. Pillar 43, which I mentioned, is the top left of enclosure D. Pillar 18 uh, well, is the one next to it, uh, also circled in green in enclosure D. And pillar 2 is in the bottom, at the bottom there in enclosure A. Now, you'll notice if you count, um, well, those black oblongs are the tops of the T-shaped pillars. Okay, and if you count the number of pillars, T-shaped pillars, in the walls of each enclosure, you'll see that in enclosure D there are 11 T-shaped pillars, and in enclosure C there are 11 T-shaped pillars in the walls of the enclosures. And I'll come back to why the number 11 might be important later on at the end of the talk. Okay, it's not advancing, let's see, oops, now I need to go back again. Okay, so this is now a more detailed map of particularly uh, enclosure D. So that's that blue oval in the, in the center of that map. This is from a paper by Kinsel and Clare just a few years ago. This shows all the different construction phases for enclosure D. Okay, so enclosure D would have been built to begin with, and then over perhaps a thousand years, uh, it was reconstructed or rebuilt in different parts, uh, so you get this patchwork. And the oldest radiocarbon dates that we have are from, well, those two black arrows point to the locations from where those radiocarbon dates were taken. So one was taken from uh, not far from pillar 43 in the wall, of the enclosure D, and another was taken from just outside to the top right of enclosure D from a fire pit or a hearth close to bedrock. So those are the oldest dates that we have. They both agree perfectly to 9,530 BC, plus or minus 200 years. But those are not the oldest parts of enclosure D. The oldest part corresponding, uh, it corresponds to the dark blue section at the bottom of enclosure D. Okay? So if, and that therefore must be older than 9,530 BC. So probably the beginning or the origin of enclosure D is into the Younger Dryas period, into the Paleolithic period. Okay, so before about 9,600 BC. But actually, we don't know, because there are no radiocarbon dates from that dark blue section at the bottom of Enclosure D. The site's archaeologists prefer to say that it's a Neolithic construction, so constructed uh, entirely after the Younger Dryas, but according to the evidence they've provided, it's my view that it's probably a paleo. It began in the Paleolithic era or in the Younger Dryas period. 
This is a, a view, you saw this before, of enclosure E. So this is outside of those four, of that main enclosure area. Um, you, can see this, you can see the smoothed bedrock of enclosure E in the foreground there. You can see just about two uh, sockets in the ground where um, some pillars would have stood. But clearly, the rest of the pillars and the walls are missing. So what happened to them? Well, we don't really know, but perhaps Perhaps those pillars were reused in the enclosures that I've just shown you. Unfortunately, there are no radiocarbon dates for enclosure E, but it might be older than the other enclosures. The point of this is to, to show you that nobody really knows how old Gobekli Tepe is. But probably, given the evidence we have, I think it began in the Younger Dryas period. Okay, so now I'm going to go through these, these eight different types of evidence uh, that point towards uh, this interpretation that we have, this kind of supporting evidence. Okay, I'm going to start with Paleolithic astronomy. So I'm going back in time many thousands of years before Gebekli Tepe, going back into the Paleolithic era when it's generally thought that everyone in the world was uh, a hunter-gatherer, a mobile hunter-gatherer. They'd roam around, perhaps have seasonal camps. You'd find your resources uh, from, the, from the land around you. So everything was seasonal at that time, at least away from the equator. Um, so all the food, uh, all your drink, all your construction materials are seasonal. So it makes sense, if you're a hunter-gatherer at that time, to understand the seasons, and you'll see that the, the seasons are determined by the sun. So you make sense to study the sun, and you'll see that the sun tracks. If you, if you study the, the, the rising points and the setting points of the sun on the horizon, you'll see that they track north and south. They cycle over an entire year, back and forth. And of course, that then defines some special days in the year, the solstices and equinoxes. So it makes sense, if you're a hunter-gatherer, uh, to pay attention to the solstices and equinoxes, probably we, we can expect to see symbolism related to the, to the solstices and equinoxes. Probably hunter-gatherers at that time uh, would have had special events, communal events, that, that um, they would gather perhaps at the, the solstices and equinoxes. That's what we might expect anyway. Okay. So that, if you like, that's a prediction. What do we actually find? So Hayden and Villeneuve reviewed back in 2011 the evidence we have for Paleolithic astronomy. One of the most important things they did in this paper was they performed an ethnographic survey. So this is a survey of relatively modern hunter-gatherers. Essentially, they consulted a database about relatively modern hunter-gatherer tribes. These are tribes that have existed over the last 100 years or so that have been investigated and researched. And what they found is that most hunter-gatherer tribes, relatively modern hunter-gatherer tribes, uh, were interested in astronomy. So they had names for stars and they had constellations. But more importantly, what they found is that the more complex uh, hunter-gatherers actually tracked the solstices and equinoxes and had um, communal gatherings on those related to those dates. So what we expect to see and what we find in relatively modern hunter-gatherer groups seems to bear out. So the argument is then, well, if that's true for modern hunter-gatherers, probably it's true for ancient hunter-gatherers true too. And I, I think that's a good argument. Just below that, you'll see what is, well, it's a, a sketch of um, a piece of antler, uh, deer antler, and that's why I suspect there are some pictures of deer heads on there. But the thing to notice is that incised in this deer antler, uh, from the Paleolithic era this is, incised in that deer antler are some marks, and there are 15 little um, semicircular marks on the upper edge and 14 semicircular marks on the lower edge. Now this is a really good indication uh, that whoever made this was following the lunar cycle. Okay, so this is work from the 1960s and 70s by a guy called Alexander Marsha. He was very interested in trying to understand all the different kinds of tally stick that have been found uh, in, in the Paleolithic era. So why is this 
a good way of, uh, of keeping track of the lunar cycle. Well, the lunar cycle is very closely 29 and a half days. So that means that if you count the number of days between each full moon, uh, you will alternately count 29 and then 30, 29, 30, and so on. And you can use this tally stick to keep track of that. So if you, if you count 15 along the top, and then 15 back again along the top, you get 30. If you count 15 along the top, but back along the bottom, 14, you get 29. Okay, so you can keep track of the lunar cycle this way. So it, it's good evidence that ancient undergatherers were actually interested in astronomy. They also, in their paper, Hayden and Villeneuve, they reviewed the work of another archaeologist, uh, uh, Chantal Jegez Volkovitz. I think, hope I've got her name correct. Now, her research on this, on this era, on astronomy, uh, Paleolithic astronomy, is hard to, to find. It's not published in regular academic journals. Nevertheless, Hayden and Villeneuve visited her personally, uh, and they discussed with her her evidence, and they presented they represented her evidence in their paper. And it's very interesting. So I've circled two plots there. The, the one on the top left shows a, a histogram for the orientation of painted caves. So Chantal had done a survey of painted caves in a particular region of southern France, and she'd measured the orientation of those caves that have Paleolithic cave art. Okay, so just the caves with the cave art in. And she measured their orientation, and she found that the orientations were very closely oriented to special astronomical days in the year. You can see from that, on the right, that right-hand bar, the tallest bar there, is showing that um, more caves uh, pointed towards the summer sunset, summer solstice sunset than in any other direction. Uh, the winter solstice sunrise was also a popular direction. If you compare that with the unpainted caves, so these are caves without any Paleolithic cave art, there seems to be no correlation in their directions at all. So it seems that Paleolithic hunter-gatherers, at least in this region, were cho specifically choosing caves that had specific astronomical alignments to do their paintings. Okay. I think that's a really interesting detail. So this is a really good example of that. Okay? The most, probably the most famous cave art at all, Lascaux Cave. Probably you're familiar with that. What you've got there is a map of Lascaux Cave. So in the top left of that map is the entrance way. Okay? And you can see that it's pointing up and to the left. And that is very close to the sunset on the summer solstice. It's not perfectly aligned to the sunset on the summer solstice. Okay? It's about three degrees. You can see there there's a picture from Stellarium, some astronomical software. I've oriented Stellarium in the direction of that cave entrance, Lascaux cave entrance. And you can see that the sun at that point on the summer solstice is, summer solstice is about three degrees higher than the actual um, horizon. So that means the orientation of the cave is about three degrees out from the sunset on the summer solstice. However, there's this picture uh, from uh, uh, some work by Leroy Goran, who's researched these, these caves extensively. This is a side profile now of the entrance to the Lascaux Cave. And it shows that the, the ground beyond the Lascaux Cave is inclined. And when you take that incline into account, it'll affect the timing of the sunset. And in fact, it's inclined by a few degrees, about three or four degrees. So actually, if that diagram is correct, actually the summer solstice, uh, the sunset on the summer solstice will shine pretty much directly down the entrance to the Lascaux cave, to within about a degree or so. So that means the paintings in that cave entrance would be illuminated only on the summer solstice and perhaps a few days, maybe a week, uh, either side of the summer solstice. So that's just one example of the kind of alignment that, um, that she found. Okay. Oops, back again. Okay, so that is Paleolithic Europe. We seem to find good evidence of uh, astronomy at that time. Now let's go forward in time to Jericho in the Fertile Crescent. 8,000 BCE, uh, there's this massive stone tower 
there is this giant stone wall. These are incredible buildings for the time, okay, for 8,000 BCE. It's true that in this tower, there is a staircase that goes up through the center of the tower. So this is work by Barquet and Loran from 2008. If you were to climb through that staircase, up through that staircase, it's very steep, but if you were to climb that staircase and come out onto the top of the tower, you would be facing very, direct, very closely towards the sunset on the summer solstice. It's about three degrees out. So that's some indication that perhaps this solar cult that seems to have been present in Paleolithic Europe might also have been present in uh, the Fertile Crescent, not far from Gebekli Tepe. Jericho is about 500 miles south of Gebekli Tepe. Now let's go to pillar 18. So this is now in enclosure D at Gebekli Tepe. So I've got three pictures there of the front of pillar 18, A, B, and C. In D, I've got uh, the, a picture of a Nibra sky disk. Now the Nibra sky disk has nothing to do with Gebekli Tepe. It's a bronze or Iron Age artifact that was discovered in Germany. But the, the thing about the Nibra sky disk is that it's generally accepted to show astronomical information. No one really doubts that. We can see the solar disk. We can see the lunar crescent. We can see a group of seven dots, which probably represent the Pleiades star cluster. And at the bottom there, we can see some kind of arc, some kind of stellar um, astronomical object. Possibly, possibly that's a comet. If we compare that with the front of pillar 18, we see at the top of pillar 18 in A, hopefully you can see that okay, a disk and a crescent. Possibly that's the sun and the moon. At the bottom of pillar 18, we see seven little birds. Now in mythology, the Pleiades are often represented either in terms of six or seven sisters or six or seven birds. And as we've already discussed, the front of pillar 18 looks to have what might be an image of a comet on it. So we can compare pillar 18 with the Nibra sky disk. They are quite similar. If, if the Nibra sky disk is showing astronomical information, then quite possibly pillar 18 is too. But that shouldn't be a particular surprise because we expect uh, hunter-gatherers, especially complex hunter-gatherers, and we can assume that Gebekli Tepe, I think, was constructed by a complex group of hunter-gatherers. We can expect them to be interested in astronomy. So there's a, a detail of the top of pillar 18 where we have this disc and crescent. We have the disc on pillar 43 on the left there. So we have what is likely astronomical information. This justifies to some extent our, uh, our, our selection of that disc on pillar 43 as being the sun, because probably that is the sun on pillar 18 too. So it justifies to some extent our, our choice. Okay, now let's move on to the, the next thing on the list, constellations, animal symbols, and myth. There are quite a few papers now in the research literature that have researched ancient myths from wide, widely across the world. And they find that some myths are so common, so similar, with, with similar motifs, that probably they are related. And in order for that to, to, be, to happen, probably it means that these myths began at a very, very early time before people dispersed across the world. So probably some of these myths that relate to astronomical phenomena, probably some of these myths are extremely ancient, perhaps 50,000 years old or more. In particular, we, uh, the Pleiades star cluster, as I've just mentioned, the myths about that relate to uh, um, uh, seven sisters or seven, uh, six or seven little birds. Uh, the, the, there's also a myth relating to uh, the plow, the Big Dipper. Quite often this myth involves a bear that's being hunted. Very often the bear is being hunted by another animal or sometimes a group of people. But these are so common across the world that it's thought that probably they are very ancient. So there's a link here between constellations, animal symbols, and myth or religion. In very deep time across, it seems, the whole world. Now let's go forward in time to after Gebekli Tepe, but in the region of the world not far from Gebekli Tepe, let's look at the Mesopotamian tradition. In, so it's particularly uh, the old Babylonian kingdom in lower Mesopotamia. Uh, Kertik has done a lot of research into the texts, uh, the cuneiform texts 
in Lower Mesopotamia. And he finds that there are at least 46 constellations mentioned in those texts. Most of them are written in Sumerian. So that means probably most of these constellations have an older origin. Sumer, the ancient kingdom of Sumer, was before the old Babylonian kingdom. It existed in the third and fourth millenniums BCE. Most of these uh, constellations are related to animals or other mythological creatures. Uh, so we have, again, in Bab old, the old Babylonian kingdom, and probably before that in ancient Sumer, we have this link between animal symbols, constellations, and myth. Now let's consider the old kingdom, Egypt. This is before the Middle and, and New Kingdoms. In the Old Kingdom, ancient Egypt, we, um, we know from the pyramid texts that there is a, a strong link between early Egyptian uh, religion and astronomy. We also know that there is a strong link between their religion and animal symbols. You can see that in the picture there. So again, there's this link between uh, religion or mythology, animal symbols, and astronomy and uh, although we don't know which constellations the old uh, kingdom Egyptians used. Okay, but in general, what we can see is that the tens of thousands of years before Quebec Tepe, right across the world, people were relating animal symbols, constellations, and myths. We see that again in the region of the world where Quebec Tepe is, this relationship between animal symbols, constellations, and myth. We see animal symbols on Pillar 43. Um, it appears that Quebec Tepe is some kind of cultic or religious center. So if we have animal symbols, we probably have myth and religion. That means it's likely, it's, we can expect to see uh, that, or at least it's reasonable to assume that the animal symbols could be related to constellations. So that justifies to some degree our choice or our interpretation of the animal symbols as, co as constellations. Now, when we published our 2017 paper, there was some pushback from the site's archaeologists. Uh, they thought it was extremely unlikely that the animal symbols on Pillar 43 could be re related to uh, the Greek constellations. That's what we suggested. Partly, I think, um, they were concerned about the time difference. So, Gebekli uh, Tepe, maybe 9,000 BC, and then um, the Greek constellations, classical Greece, you know, 500 BC. So, they were probably concerned about that time difference. How can constellations survive for so, uh, for so long? But also, probably they were concerned about the standard view for the origin of the Greek constellations. Uh, so there is a standard story for them, which, this, uh, which, which our idea um, uh, contradicts. So let's just go through the standard story for the, for the Greek con uh, origin of the Greek constellations. So we know that our, the Greek constellations that we still use today in our Western constellation set, set, we know that they are recorded in Ptolemy's Almagest, about 150 AD. And we can also trace that back uh, those constellations back to Eudoxus uh, in Greece, about th the mid fourth century BCE. Now, Eudoxus's work on uh, astronomy uh, no longer exists, but we know that his astronomical text was converted to a poetic form by Aratus. So there was a poetic form of his astronomy, and that was in about 250 BC. So that's how we know that Eudoxus. Uh, recorded the Greek constellations in his, in his uh, astronomical text. But before that time, it gets a bit difficult to, to trace the origin of the Greek constellations. That's about as far as we can go back with much confidence. What we do know is that the zodiacal Greek constellations, so these are the ones that are on the path of the sun, we know that they existed in Babylon at around uh, 600, well, from at least 650 BCE. The other constellations, it's thought perhaps they came from elsewhere. We, we see a few of the non-zodiacal constellations in works by Hesiod and Homer, and we suspect that those myths that they were telling which involve some of these constellations have an even older origin, perhaps back to the second millennium B. 
BC. So this account of the origin of the Greek constellations is uh, what's uh, essentially recorded or written by John Rogers in two papers. These are the most highly cited papers on the origins of the Greek constellations. If you were to read his, if you were just to skim his papers, just read the abstracts, you would think that this is known as a fact, that essentially the Greeks obtained their zodiacal constellations from Babylon and the rest from elsewhere. But if you actually read his papers carefully, you'll find that that is conjecture. The evidence to support that uh, is very weak. Essentially, the evidence is we know the zodiacal, we know zodiacal constellations similar to the Greek ones existed in Babylon. Therefore, that's where the Greeks got them from. Okay, it's conjecture. So we don't know where exactly the Greek constellations came from. In fact, John Rogers', John Rogers uh, thesis, his view, which he wrote as fact in his abstract of those papers, is actually contradicted by the evidence. So there is, um, there is a work by a guy called Pseudo Eratosthenes. Okay? Uh, we don't know exactly who Pseudo Eratosthenes is. It could have been Eratosthenes himself. But he wrote a summary of the catastrophism of Eratosthenes. The catastrophism no longer exists. We don't have a copy. But we do have copies of, his, of the, the summary of the catastrophism by Pseudo Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes. Anyway, in that summary, there is a myth recorded or attributed to Hesiod of the constellation Orion and the constellation Scorpius. So that suggests then, uh, and, and Hesiod was around in the 7th and 8th centuries BCE, uh, and probably the myths, he was, we were, well, the myths he was recording were from an earlier time. So that suggests that the Greeks already knew at least of some of the zodiacal constellations. So this directly contradicts what John Rogers is saying in his papers about the origin of the Greek constellations. So the point is we don't really know where they came from. The modern view of where they came from is that probably a lot of them came from Turkey. We know from archaeological evidence that there was a lot of exchange of people uh, between Greece and the Turkish mainland. Scholars have now been able to decipher many texts from Hattusa. Hattusa is the capital of the ancient Hittite kingdom from the middle of the second millennium BCE. And, it's, uh, and those, texts, those texts reveal that some of, the, um, the, some of the ancient Greek myths are very similar to some of the ancient Hittite myths. So clearly there was a lot of exchange of ideas and mythology. If they were exchanging ideas and mythology, possibly they were exchanging constellations too. And it makes sense to suggest that perhaps the Greeks obtained many of their constellations from Turkey because it borders both Greece and Mesopot Lower Mesopotamia. So it's a third country that both of, those, um, both of those cultures, the ancient Greeks and ancient Mesopotamians, could have obtained their constellations from. Of course, Gobekli Tepe is also in Turkey. So the modern view is that this story, which uh, some people think is, is, is correct, is really just conjecture. We don't exactly know where the Greeks obtained their constellations from. We also know that just outside Hattusa is a rock sanctuary. And uh, it was used by uh, the Hattusian nobility uh, and it records uh, and it depicts a procession of characters. And if you want, if you count those characters in their processions in this rock sanctuary, you can construct a lunar solar calendar. So we know that the Hittites are also very interested in, in astronomy. So it's just worth noting that there is this lunar solar, what is probably a lunar solar calendar at Hattusa. Okay, now I want to talk about Gerstein's prediction. So I think what we're seeing on Pillar 43 at Gebekli was predicted by Gerstein. Gerstein was uh, a Russian astronomer. Sadly, he passed away uh, a few years ago, but he was an astronomer and historian of, of science. And he wrote a few papers about 25 years ago or so uh, that describe um, uh, this, this, this idea of writing down a date using precession of the equinoxes with four constellation symbols. 
Before I get into that, I just want to also note that uh, Hughes wrote a paper in 2005 about the likelihood that ancient people, ancient sky watchers, probably recorded or probably noticed the, the, um, the phenomena of precession. Okay, so he said, he argued that anyone who was watching the skies, anyone who had, was watching the solstices and equinoxes for 100 years, say, or, or you know, several generations, anyone who was watching, recording the solstices and equinoxes for that long would undoubtedly notice precession. So precession is this phenomena where if you look at where on the summer solstice or the other solstices and equinoxes, if you record the constellation uh, where the sun is, then you'll notice that that constellation is gradually drifting by. And over 26,000 years, um, the, the, the constellation for the summer solstice, for instance, will go through a complete cycle of the zodiac in 26,000 years. That's known as the Great Year. So that was what Hughes said. Now, he was thinking particularly about the builders of Stonehenge. Okay, so Stonehenge uh, has some solstitial alignments, and it lasted for a long time. So his argument was that the builders of Stonehenge probably knew about precession. Giulio Magli, a professional archaeoastronomer, also argues that cultures from around that time would likely have known about precession. Okay, so because of the accuracy of the astronomical uh, records, probably the ancient uh, Egyptians, the ancient Babylonians, uh, Mesopotamians, and Indus Valley cultures, he suspects uh, that they probably also knew about precession. Okay. So the, the idea that precession was discovered by Hipparchus in the second century BC is probably not correct. Other cultures likely knew about precession long before that. Anyway, so that's what Hughes predicted. If that is true, for the builders of Stonehenge and some other cultures from the Bronze Age, then it's probably also true for ancient hunter-gatherers, because as I've just explained, we can expect ancient hunter-gatherers to have observed the solstices and equinoxes for a long time, and the, uh, the ethnographic data suggests that many of those, uh, many hunter-gatherer tribes did do that. So precession was probably known. Now, Gerstein, this Russian astronomer, historian of science, he had the same view. So he thought that uh, people from the early, ne early Neolithic period, probably they would have written down a, a world age in terms of precession of the equinoxes and four constellations corresponding to the solstices and equinoxes. And this table is from one of his papers. Now, Gerstein predicted that this this idea of writing a world age probably began in around about 6,000 BC, because at the time he was writing his papers, that's when it was believed that agriculture first began. So he thought the, early, the world's earliest farmers would probably have used um, this method of keeping track of the solstices, or writing down the solstices and equinoxes in terms of a world age. He thought that began with the world's first farmers. Now we now know uh, you know, 25 years later, that, that farming began thousands of years before that. So you can extend his argument back by a few thousand years. But we also now think, of course, that uh, ancient hunter-gatherers would have been just as interested in the solstices and equinoxes, so probably they could have done the same thing as well. So just using his table, if we ask, what, how would you write down the date of the Younger Dryas impact, you would choose Virgo, Sagittarius, Pisces, and Gemini, okay? So I've added that top line onto his table. That's not in his table, I've added it, the date of the Younger Dryas impact. That is exactly what we think we see on pillar 43. At the top of the pillar, we have Pisces, we think we, think we have Gemini, and we think we have something similar to Virgo. On the main part of the pillar 43, we have what we think is Sagittarius, or something similar to it. So our work, in some way, tends to confirm Gerstein's prediction. He made the prediction, we think we see this on Pillar 43. He died shortly after we published our work. I don't know if he knew about it, certainly he never contacted me. Another concern of the site's archaeologists was that there was an extremely long time between 
What we're suggesting uh, is on pillar 43, so that's about 9, 10,000 BC, extremely long time between then and the Greek constellation. So how do we account for that long time? So I want to talk about the master of animals. It turns out to be a very important symbol in this story. So on this page, I'm showing lots of different examples of the master of animals. Okay, so the master of animals is either, well, it's usually a male figure, sometimes a female figure. And the master typically holds two animals, uh, typically grasps them, and these animals are sort of opposing the, the figure in between. So I'm showing there examples of the master of animal symbols. Uh, it appears widely across um, Greece, uh, Babylon, uh, Me uh, Mesopotamia, Egypt, Iran, Indus Valley. It even appears in Indo-European countries, uh, including Celtic cultures. Okay, so it's very widely, uh, widely known. On this slide, I'm showing examples from classical Greece right through to pre-dynastic Egypt. In most cases, the zodiac or the animal symbols that are used in the master of animal symbols agree with either the Greek zodiac or the zodiac we can deduce from Gebekli Tepe. The one in the middle there uh, is from the Indus Valley uh, civilization. It has a seated master of animals, and oppo it's, he's opposed by uh, four animals, as you'd expect, um, given Gerstein's theory for writing the world age. So that could be consistent with Gerstein's prediction, the four animals. Problem is, we don't recognize the zodiac for that culture. We recognize the bull and the tiger, which is probably representing Leo in that picture, but we're not familiar with the elephant or the rhino as zodiacal symbols. However, in ancient, well, in Paleolithic European cave art, the mammoth or the elephant and the rhino are very popular um, paintings. So it's possible then that the Indus Valley civilization was using a much more ancient zodiac from the Paleolithic era. It's a possibility. It's one that I think is probably correct. So we've gone from in, the, in this series of a master of animals pictures, we've gone from classical Greece through to pre-dynastic Egypt. But we can go back further. In the top left there is another master of animals holding two snakes. And the snakes, uh, holding two snakes is a common um, master of animals uh, emblem too. And in the middle there, on that top panel, we see what is probably the same deity wrestling with a giant snake. Now that to us looks very much like, look, looks very much like the Ophiuchus constellation. In fact, we can even see stars in the background of that upper middle uh, picture there. It's probably, so I, sus I suspect that it's related to, to Ophiuchus. And underneath that, I've shown uh, our modern day interpretation of Ophiuchus from Stellarium. Ophiuchus happens to be the autumn equinox constellation at 4000 BCE and around that time. So again, that, that top panel is consistent with Gerstein's prediction. But we don't, with these master of animal symbols, we don't always have four animals. Sometimes we just have two, sometimes just the one kind of animal. Top right, we have what looks like a mistress of animals uh, from Chattelhoyuk. Chattelhoyuk is one of the world's earliest town. It's about 400 miles west of, of, of Gebekli Tepe. And it dates to about 7,000 to 6,000 BCE. So that mistress of animals is now sitting uh, and is holding two felines, two, two leopards probably. But we can go back even further. So underneath that bottom right is quite a new discovery from very near Gebekli Tepe, a little village called Sheberk. And there are these wall carvings. And we have what is probably another master of animals, this time flanked by uh, two, two lions or two leopards. Again, that is consistent with the Greek zodiac. So what we have here is symbolism that seems to persist, seems to endure from around the time of Gebekli Tepe through the Neolithic period into the Bronze Age and thereby to us. And importantly, we have the animals that are with the master or mistress of animals. The animals seem to be consistent through time as well. We have the same kinds of animals and we know 
or at least it's generally thought that those animal symbols by the time you get to the Bronze Age and to classical Greece are related to the Greek constellations. So we have a direct link now via the master of animals for the animal symbols at Gebekli Tepe through to uh, modern times. So we can, again, this, uh, this to some extent justifies our interpretation of the animal symbols at Gebekli Tepe in terms of uh, Greek constellations. Okay, now let's talk about handbags. We think, in this interpretation, the handbags probably represent sunsets, okay? So it's the semicircular part of the handbag that is important. So I'm showing here um, a, a stone weight, sometimes called a handbag, from the Juroft culture in Iran, mid-third millennium BCE. Again, we have the master of animals, and we have some zodiac-like uh, animals that are consistent with the Greek zodiac and consistent with Gerstein's theory. And we have this semicircular shape, which we suspect the importance here is the fact that it's a semicircle representing, um, probably representing the sunset. There are lots of examples of these stone weights or handbags from the Giroft culture. For some of them, the semicircular shape is really clearly defined. Uh, and uh, in most cases, the animals and the pictures that are shown on these uh, so-called handbags are either consistent with the Greek zodiac or with the Gebekli Tepe uh, zodiac. This is the Uruk vase from the uh, Sumerian, ancient Sumerian city, mid-fourth millennium BCE. Uh, it shows, it depicts uh, a celebration of a festival of Inanna. Inanna, it's thought, is, it was a deity related to Venus. Now, at the top of the pillar, that's right, at the top of the, not the pillar, at the top of the vase, we have, again, what look like two sunset symbols. And above them are two zodiac-like animal symbols. We have a lion, so we can relate that to Leo, but we're not familiar with the goat or the ibex. But in 1965, astronomer William Hartner suggested the ibex probably, in this context, the ibex probably represented something similar to Aquarius. And again, that would fit with Gerstein's theory. That would be consistent with the system of zodiacal dating. But it's now known that um, in, uh, in ancient Sumer, in the very earliest eras of writing, when people were using logograms, to write, that the sun was represented in their texts by a crescent, sorry, not a crescent, by a semicircle on a, a curved horizon, okay? So that symbol that I've circled there means the sun or a day. We also know that when you turn that symbol on its side, the ancient Sumerians used that symbol to represent different units of time. So they used it to represent the day, a, a unit of time of a day, 10 days, a month, and so on. So a sunset on a, on a horizon is known to be used to represent both the sun and units of time. And this is in prehistoric ancient Sumer. And we've seen how symbolism can last, we think, from the time of Gebekli Tepe through to the Bronze Age. We've seen that because of the master of animals. So it's possible that this symbolism, too, can have survived that period. Here's another example. Uh, so this rock graffiti was found by archaeologists or Egyptologists, Darnell and Darnell, husband and wife, uh, and they interpret this scene as evidence for a mythical scorpion king. Okay, and that's because, and I've circled it there, that we have a scorpion, and above that is a hawk symbol. Uh, now, in, in Egyptian hieroglyphics, the hawk generally means Horus or Pharaoh or king. So they interpret that to mean king scorpion. And the guy on the left there, they interpret to be the Scorpion King. But they didn't have, uh, in my view, a particularly good explanation for what that semicircle shape on, the on, a, on a line means. They suggested it might indicate a boat or perhaps uh, a seat or something of that nature. Nor could they explain what the other animals are doing in that picture. But this entire scene is consistent with Gerstein's theory and a zodiacal date. Okay? So we have... Uh, 
uh, bird of prey and scorpion on the front of pillar 43. We have the bird wrestling with a snake on the front of pillar 43. We have tall birds on the front of pillar 43. The ibex or the goat we can interpret from the Uruk vase as meaning something like Aquarius. If this is correct, then probably the guy who is thought to be the Scorpion King is actually Orion. And we can see that he's wearing a very prominent belt. So probably this is an astronomical scene that's writing a date using Gerstein's um, uh, uh, theory. And in fact, the date that you interpret from that is around about 5, 000, uh, 3,500 to 3,600 BC, which is more or less consistent with what Darnell and Darnell thought for this scene. So these handbags, it seems, or these semicircles on a horizon are present much later, and we find them in a very consistent way on pillar 43, where we interpret them to mean the same thing. In fact, when we wrote our 2017 paper, we had no idea about Gerstein's theory. We had no idea about it at all. It seems that we have uh, given strong support to his prediction. This system of writing the date would have existed uh, a long time ago. Okay, now let's move on to the Chattelhoyuk bear shrines. So I mentioned that Chattelhoyuk is an ancient town, population of maybe five to 10,000, uh, which is, and it's about 400 miles west of Gebekli Tepe. And it existed at a time from around about 7,000 to 6,000 BCE. Now at Chattelhoyuk, there are four kinds of wall relief, wall relief in the form of animal symbols. There are only four kinds. There are other kinds of wall decoration, so there are paintings, and there are what are called wall inclusions, but there are only four kinds of wall relief, okay? So these are layers of plaster and paint, layer upon layer, that are built up to create these wall reliefs. So you can see all four of them in these two pictures. We have um, this splayed quadruped, we have what are ram wall or sheep wall reliefs, we have bull wall, re wall reliefs, and we have leopard wall reliefs. So there are only four, and they are animal shapes, and that reminds us of Gerstein's prediction for a system of zodiacal, or writing a world age. If we compare that splayed quadruped from Chattelhoyuk, it used to be thought that that symbol represented a goddess, because we, we know also of the mistress of animals that, that has been found. Uh, this little statuette at, at Chattelhoyuk. More modern interpretation is that it's probably a bear, a, a displayed quadruped is probably a bear, because we found, or the archaeologists have found, seal stamps at Chattelhoyuk uh, in the form of a bear. So probably it's a bear. The same symbol, practically the same symbol, has been found at Gebekli Tepe in one of the enclosures. We have that carving there, and it looks very similar to the symbol at the top right of pillar 43. Now, I don't know any other theory that can easily and naturally explain why we have probably the same symbol at the top right of pillar 43 next to a sunset or a semicircle, whilst at Chattelhoyuk, we have this symbol, one of four, with a, with a circle on its belly. All of these bear shrines at Chattelhoyuk have a circle on their tummy. The zodiac theory, or Gerstein's theory, can uh, explain this, of course, because we think it represents, uh, this symbol represents Virgo. At the time of the Younger Dryas impact, Virgo was the spring equinox constellation. At the time that Chattelhoyuk was occupied, it was the summer solstice constellation, and that's why it has a circle on its belly. The last thing I'd like to talk about is a lunar solar calendar. Remember I mentioned that, that there is probably a lunar solar calendar that's been discovered at the, the Hittite capital, Hattusha. So a couple of years ago, nearly two years ago, uh, a guy from California called Dr. John Gordon, he contacted me just out of the blue, and he showed me that on pillar 43, there was this line of V symbols just above the, the vulture or eagle. And probably that is counting a lunar, uh, counting a lunar cycle. Uh, up until this point, I thought that perhaps these were decorations, but it turns out that there are actually 
15 upturned V symbols in that row and 14, sorry, 15 upright V symbols in that row and 14 uh, downward pointing V symbols or lambda signals, symbols, okay? So if we, and I just remind you of Yazila uh, uh, if we zoom into that part of pillar 43, we can have a, a closer look. So we have that line of V symbols, which we can interpret as for, the, for exactly the same way that I showed you that, that piece of antler from Paleolithic Europe. We can count a lunar cycle using that, those V symbols. Underneath that are a row of 11 small boxes. If we interpret those 11 small boxes to mean repeat the above count, that means that we have 12 lunar cycles. Well, 12 lunar cycles is 354 days. Underneath those 11 boxes are 10 V symbols. We think the V symbol means a single day, so if we add those on, that's 364 days. So we seem to be one day short of a complete solar year. But on pillar 43, there is another V symbol at the neck of the eager vulture, which that arrow is pointing to. Okay, and this V symbol has the same size and the same angle as the other V symbols. Remember, we've already interpreted the eagle or vulture to be the um, summer solstice constellation. So possibly that V symbol at its neck is indicating a day, the summer solstice, a special day in the year. If we add it on, of course, we get a full solar year of 365 days. So it seems that on this pillar we have uh, a data construction, if you like, indicating that they knew how to count the days in a year. It's 12 lunar cycles plus 11 extra days. So this is currently, this work is currently in peer review. It's been in peer review for quite a long time now. I'm hoping that it will come out relatively soon. Remember at the beginning, I said that there are 11 T-shaped pillars in the walls of enclosure D and C. So that would suggest that perhaps those particular enclosures were used as a calendrical device. Perhaps there were festivals in those enclosures on solstices and equinoxes. Here's a shot from Karahan Tepe. Uh, it's quite well known now. It's about 40 miles east of Gebetli Tepe. This particular structure is, is, a, is, a, is like a pool room that's dug down into the bedrock, and we have 11 pillars in that pool. So again, the number, of 11, the number 11 appears to be special. I suspect that this was also had a uh, calendrical function. And finally, if we look at Urfa Man, which was found in Shanli Urfa and is contemporaneous with the Gebekli Tepe, and again we look at the Sheburk wall carving, we see that they too have Vs at their necks. Probably they're the same deity. Probably that V is indicating, uh, it's not just decoration, probably that V is a special symbol related to time. So we can think of these as perhaps being deities, perhaps they were time-controlling deities, or perhaps they were created deities. But the fact that they have V symbols at their neck justifies our interpretation of the V symbol at the, at the vulture eagle's neck. Probably it's not just decoration, it has a meaning. So to conclude then, uh, given all of this supporting evidence, when we combine that supporting evidence with the very strong correlation that we see on pillar 43 with uh, uh, the Greek uh, set of constellations that we expect to see if our hypothesis is correct. When we combine that, all that information together, then yes, Pillar 43 is almost certainly a date stamp. The animals are almost certainly precursors to the Greek constellations. But that really shouldn't be that controversial because the conventional story for the Greek origin of the Greek constellations is just conjecture anyway. Okay, I think I've probably run out of time, so I'm going to finish there, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.